So um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I will say though that the slides that I'm presenting, I will show you a link at the end of the um, presentation that you can have access to for teaching purposes. We obviously have various agents that manage diabetes because Pose is um, throughout the body and there's various organs that are involved in its metabolism. Um, so just a brief review of what's available currently. Um, metformin obviously is the mainstay of treatment, the first line, and its role is really in, in, in improving insulin sensitivity, decreasing hepatic glucose production. But there's been a, a couple of new tools that we have in our toolbox over the years. Sulfonylureas have been around a long time. They work on the pancreas to increase increase insulin secretion. And the newer classes of medications have focused on other areas where we can manipulate sugar uh, utilization and uptake in order to prevent hyperglycemia. And among those are the incretin class of medications. So that goes without reason, without saying that farm companies have looked at other areas and the kidney has been really relatively untouched up, up until this time. We know that glucose is filtered through the kidney and a significant proportion of it is reabsorbed. So now we have a new agent, which are the SGL LD2 inhibitors that um, work at this level in a unique way, separate from all the other agents that we have to uh, decrease hyperglycemia. So how does it work? Well, there are two different receptors, SGLT1 and SGLT2. SGLT2 is the predominant one at the level of the nephron, and it is involved in reabsorbing predominantly most of the glucose that's filtered through the kidney. Um, and then SGLT1 is working mostly at the gut. Um, there is some in the kidney as well, and um, surprisingly a little bit in the, in the heart as well, but its role there is not really well described. So SGLT2 inhibitors work at the kidney to prevent that reabsorption of the filtered glucose, and you end up essentially urinating out all of the filtered glucose um, that is handled by the kidney. Um, that works mostly at the proximal segment and um, glucose is filtered through and then lost through the urine. With the action of these agents, not all of the glucose is lost. Approximately 50% of filtered glucose will end up being acted upon by this particular class of medications. So the rationale of using these agents in diabetes is that it will improve your sugar control. If you're not retaining sugar and you're losing it, you will see less hyperglycemia. And the other side benefit is that if you're not keeping that caloric content, you will also see some weight loss. It acts independently of insulin, so we're not trying to act on this poor, tired pancreas to keep on pouring out extra insulin, and that's always a good thing. There's potentially less risk for things like hypoglycemia because you're not, again, working through an insulin-dependent mechanism. And it seems like it would be compatible with other medications because it's a unique mechanism of action. And as you are inducing an osmotic diuresis, you should see some benefit um, in blood pressure as well. So we do have several agents that are available now in Canada. One, the first one out of the gate is canagliflozin, which is also known as Invacana. That's been out for about a year and a half now. Um, and then followed by dapafloglozin, which is Farziga, and most recently empafloglozin, which is uh, Jardians. They work well. I'll tell you exactly how well in a second. And they are indicated in combination with other agents, including insulin, as long as there's no contraindication to their use. And the main contraindication is uh, you have to have good kidney function or an uh, estimated GFR of greater than 60. Disadvantages is that you see more sugar in the urinary tract, along with that, more signs of infection, both urinary and genital infections, predominantly in women. These are usually manageable with um, regular run-of-the-mill medications that you would use to treat UTIs and yeast infections. The other downside is potentially too much of an effect on blood pressure um, due to the osmotic diuresis. And the big one on the bottom here is the increased incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis, which has really come about um, post-marketing. Um, we're seeing more of that in both type 1 and type 2. It's not indicated for use in type 1 diabetes. However, people still use it in type 1 diabetes. And in type 2 diabetes, it's been a bit of a surprise how frequently we're seeing uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, FDA and Health Canada have uh, put out a warning that there is an increased risk. And locally, we've certainly seen many cases, and we've um, in the process of publishing a case series on the Ottawa cohort of, of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, with type 2 diabetics on this class of medications. 
So they work, not surprisingly, A1C does get lowered. On its own, you're probably looking at a 0.7% reduction in hemoglobin A1C. So compared to your other agents for diabetes, not a great reduction, a modest reduction. And added on top of other regularly used medications, you do see a complementary effect, so an additional effect. And you do see some weight changes, although we're not talking about a 100-pound weight loss here. We're talking about, on average, around 2 to 3 kilograms of weight loss. And again, if you're using it with other weight loss-promoting medications, you may see more weight loss, things like the Incretin class of medication and metformin. That was the story until about September. Um, EASD is sort of the second main diabetes conference we have in the diabetes world. The first is ADA. And usually EASD doesn't really present a whole lot of new data. Most of that gets taken up by ADA in June. So surprisingly, um, EASD this year in September um, came out with the breaking news that this new medication, uh, uh, empagliflozin has been shown to reduce cardiovascular deaths. And since then, everybody is talking about this study, which is the EMPA-REG study. And it really is taken over sort of the diabetes literature. I've been to several conferences since September, and that's all everybody's talking about. And I'm sure um, this weekend at IDF, that's going to be the main topic as well. So how does empagliflozin work? Well, it is an SGLT2 inhibitor. It's highly selective, and that may be important when we start talking about is this a class effect versus is there something unique about this particular medication. It does cause glucose reduction by causing renal glucose excretion. And in type 2 diabetes, it does lead to A1C reduction, weight loss, as well as reduction in blood pressure without a significant increase in heart rate. The EMPA-REG study was a, designed as a non-inferiority study. Now that we have sort of guidelines for diabetes medication to prove that it is safe from a cardiac standpoint, all uh, diabetes medications have to go through this process. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, and the objective was to examine the long-term effects of empagliflozin versus placebo, in addition to standard care on cardiac morbidity, mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes and existing high risk of cardiovascular events. It was uh, done worldwide, 590 sites in 42 countries, over 7,000 uh, patients enrolled, and there were uh, randomized into three arms, placebo, EMPA at a low dose of 10 milligrams versus EMPA at a high dose of 25 milligrams. This was added to standard care, so other diabetes medications were used. Um, they just didn't, um, they shouldn't have been adjusted in the 12 weeks prior to enrollment. The key inclusion criteria, type two diabetics, so no type ones, BMI less than 45, I think that's pretty, it's gonna capture most of your type two diabetic patients. A1C pretty wide range, seven to 10%. The mean came out to about eight point something. And there has to be established cardiovascular disease. So a prior MI, coronary artery disease, stroke, unstable angina, et cetera. And the key exclusion criteria is a low EGFR. So the primary outcome was this three-point MACE system where you had time to first occurrence to cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke, and the secondary outcome was a four-point MACE uh, which included hospitalization for unstable angina. So looking at the baseline characteristics, this is people I see every day. There's nothing that really stands out. So the mean age is around 60, as in a lot of studies, mostly male, um, spread out throughout uh, the, the world. Um, A1C mean was 8.08%. And the key here to note is that these were patients who had diabetes for a while. So most of them, over half, had had diabetes for over 10 years. Again, very typical of the type of patients that I would see as an endocrinologist. And they were all on various different glucose-lowering agents. Um, metformin was used a lot, which would make sense with all of the guidelines suggesting its first line use. Um, and the other thing to note is that insulin was also used quite frequently. So about half of the patients in the study were also on insulin. So again, we're not, we're not dealing with a, a, a milder diabetic, um, someone who's had a recent onset. 
In terms of cardiovascular disease, um, again, a hodgepodge, but as you would expect with this high-risk population, significant amount have had a, a history of a prior MI, about half and heart failure about 10%. So not perhaps as high as you might think given some of the results I'm gonna show you later. They were all on good medication, so you know there's always the argument with these newer cardiac uh, mortality studies is, well, you know, in the era post ACE inhibitor statins, are you really, really gonna see that much of a benefit in a three-year trial of a diabetes medication? Well, these patients were on, uh, you know, significantly, a uh, significant portion, proportion of them were already on liver lowering medications, statins, ASA, um, and uh, I didn't show you the blood pressure data, but they were all pretty well controlled for their blood pressure with a mean systolic blood pressure about 135. So the not surprising results to start off with. So A1C reduction, as I showed you with the previous SGLT2 inhibitor data, you do see an A1C reduction. You see an A1C reduction that is modest, about 0.7%, and that's what we saw in, in, in this trial. And the nice thing is that you, you see that with both of the doses, low dose and high dose. Weight, there was a, again, modest weight reduction, about two, three kilogram weight loss. Not huge, but considering the natural history of diabetics is that they will gain weight over time, it is always nice to see a diabetes medication that does not promote weight gain, which has been the case up until the recent years. Systolic blood pressure, there was a blood pressure reduction. Again, you know, you can argue whether this is significant or not. I think it is significant. We're seeing about anywhere from at the you know, middle of the trial versus the end, anywhere from a three to five millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. There was sort of a neutral, but maybe even a adverse effect on LDL cholesterol. So you can see sort of towards the middle part here that LDL levels were higher in those treated with empagliflozin. Um, towards the end of the trial, it kind of, the, the, the curves kind of overlap a little bit. It's balanced off by a, also a mild increase in HDL cholesterol. And, and you know, these are in milligrams per deciliter, but they're pretty close to what we would consider target for our type 2 diabetic population, so LDL. The, the mean was around 2.1, and HDL, we're talking about a mean about 1.1 millimoles per liter. So here's where the surprising results came in. So when, it, when they looked at the primary outcome, cardiovascular death, the empagliflozin group did significantly better, and the hazards ratio was 0.6. So even though it was designed as a non-inferiority trial, because it was such a significant p-value, um, and I don't understand all the stats about this, but my, what I've read and what the explanation has been is that if you have that degree of a significant p-value, it now can turn into a superiority trial. So this drug did have a benefit. And the other th big thing that's been really talked about quite extensively is how quickly those two curves separate right from the onset. So really we're not seeing a separation at 12 weeks, which is what you typically would expect if we're talking about um, some more long-term metabolic changes like LDL or glucose, but really, really early on, within weeks, we're seeing a separation of the two curves and the curves continue to separate over the course of the trial. There was not a big difference between the low dose and the high dose. Um, they both showed a superiority, um, maybe a little bit more with the higher dose. And when you divide it up into your, your different primary outcomes, it really was the death, the cardiovascular death that drove that endpoint um, to be such a significant number. So the other big thing that came out was hospitalization for heart failure. So um, when they looked at that independently with the uh, group that was treated with this medication, um, there was a similar separation of the curve when it comes to hospitalization for heart failure. So this was a bit surprising. I showed you the, the baseline data. They had a 10% pop, uh, pre-existing uh, history of heart failure in the baseline population, and to get this degree of a significance at the endpoint is uh, pretty remarkable. If you 
Next question is, what was driving that cardiovascular death? Was it death from heart failure that really improved in this group? It really wasn't. I mean, they looked at sort of the different um, um, things that the people actually passed away from, and it was a mixed bag, you know, MI, sudden death, arrhythmia. There was a 40% unspecified uh, cardiac, cardiovascular death um, category, so that may somehow be, you know, directing the results one way or the other. So that's certainly um, uh, something that could be unexplained there. Um, there's been some literature that suggests that maybe certain types of arrhythmias are, uh, ventricular arrhythmias are included in that unspecified group, and maybe that's what drove um, the, the reduction. So the summary of this trial is that it reduced the total risk for the three-point MACE, the primary outcome, by 14%. It did improve glycemic control, although nobody believes that it was the glycemic control that caused this degree of positive cardiac outcomes. We haven't seen that with any of the other diabetes trials in the past, and the, and the effect was so early on that it really would be um, uh, unexpected if it is related to glucose lowering. There is reduction um, in weight and blood pressure, um, so that certainly um, is quite positive. And there may be a small increase in LDL and HDL that perhaps uh, balance each other out. The empagliflozin was increased with some side of, uh, was associated with some side effects, not unexpected genital infections, but otherwise was pretty well tolerated. They didn't see an increased risk of DKA in this large trial of 7,000 people. Um, so that's again quite positive where we're seeing really quite a bit of DKA with some of the other classes of medication, other medications in this class. Um, it reduced the heart failure by hospitalization for heart failure by 35%, reduced cardiovascular death by 38%, and improved survival by, uh, by reducing all cause mortality by 32%. So, the key features here is a high risk cardiovascular population with modest hyperglycemia, mean A1C 8% already on standard glucose-lowering therapy, 50% of them already on insulin, and 97% of patients completed the study, was well-tolerated, um, and the low dose versus high dose did not really show a big difference, so you can really safely use a low dose of the medication and, and really get a lot of bang for the buck. So when you look at sort of the, um, the net effect in, in this trial, for three years in 1,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, 25 lives were saved, 22 fewer cardiovascular deaths, 14 fewer hospitalizations for heart failure, 53 additional genital infections. So number needed to treat, looking at when statins first came out, this is a 4S study with simvastatin for 5.4 years, the number needed to treat was about 30. Then came along the ACE inhibitor, so HOPE trial, number needed to treat was about 56. And now we have empagliflozin, the number needed to treat was 39. So again, really unexpected and uh, quite remarkable for a diabetes medication. So the next question is why? Why are we seeing this effect? in this particular diabetes medication, and there's been lots of hypotheses floating around. It likely does have something to do with the diuresis effect of this medication because you are causing purposely that osmotic diuresis at the kidney. You're going to see um, fluid that's being lost. You're going to see an improvement in blood pressure, and there may be other unexplained mechanisms that we don't know yet. They've looked in the heart. There are no SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, in, uh, SGLT2 receptors at the heart level. So it's not a direct receptor effect, but there may be other mechanisms uh, related with the vasculature. Now, up until this point, the meta-analyses of intensive glucose control in type 2 diabetes has been somewhat less than impressive. So really with mostly driven by studies like Accord and VADT, really we're not seeing um, benefits in terms of intensive glucose lowering. So at best we're seeing a neutral effect and, um, and maybe if we inter uh, interfere with glycemic management early on with metformin, you may see a positive effect much later on uh, with the UK PDS, we're talking about 10, 20 years later on, you're seeing a, a benefit in cardiovascular outcomes. So this is clearly different. So that's why we don't think this is really related to sugar lowering on its own. 
The next question is, is all SGLT2 inhibitors created equal? Well, we don't know, okay? So the studies um, are, are coming, um, 2017, I believe, with DAPA gliflozin, and then CANA gliflozin, I believe, is 2017. Uh, those trials will be finishing up, and we should hopefully see similar effects. Um, but there are some subtle pharmacokinetic differences between these medications um, in terms of selectivity for that SGLT2 um, receptor. So again, at, at this time, it really is only this particular medication that um, should be used in a high-risk cardiac population if you're hoping to see this kind of benefit. So where does this fit in our uh, algorithm for managing diabetes? Well, nothing's gonna replace metformin. That's, that's really the, our first line that's been out there for a long time with good evidence on safety. Um, so really a first line with anybody with type two diabetes, metformin should be used unless there's a contraindication. However, when it comes to the add-on therapies, you are going to choose the agent that's best suited to the individual, and it could be dependent on the degree of hyperglycemia. So if someone's A1C is 11% on metformin, you're not gonna choose this medication because it's not gonna lower the sugar enough. And in that setting where they're so catabolically um, negative, they're losing so much sugar, is there going to be any additional benefit of a medication like this? I don't know. So I think really it's best used in that specific population with pretty stable diabetes, modest elevation in, in, in A1C, who has those features of higher cardiovascular risk. So this is just um, highlighting the things that I've talked about, adding the second agent, and hypoglycemia um, management and reduction is always very important because there is independently um, associated uh, risk of death with hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemic events in, in diabetes. So definitely something to always be on the lookout for. I promise these are the slides. Um, so if you go under Empereg, you'll be able to find them. Um, and uh, I thank you for your attention.